recording. Okay, so everything is now being recorded. All right, so first thing first, okay, let me go back to the browser. Okay, here we go. So today's lecture is going to take a look at the LDI instruction, which is the additive instruction on row 19, as well as the optical called store, which is further down, it is on row 31. <coughs> So I'm going to start off with the, the one that is slightly more complicated, which is the LDI instruction. So this is the LDI instruction, <coughs> which is the opcode is 0110118K. So the only default is one random number. Um, the <clears throat> the RTL, the Register Transfer Language Description, looks a little bit funky on this one, okay? Because it says the register X is getting a deregment of PC++. In other words, we are using the program counter as a pointer. The pointer itself is supposed to be going to be used to deregment the program, and then get it to the to know exactly what is a pointer in CISD 360 because we are actually looking at the use of a pointer from the hardware perspective. So to some people, this can be helping you know, because you know, now they can actually see, oh, okay, so a pointer does this, okay? All right, so now we switch to the assembler because I want to show you, you know, an instruction. This is the one that I used the other day and I'm gonna switch to use a different one. So where is the file? Can I use it? Yep, there we go. So I need to go to somewhere, and this time I'm going to try maybe LDI register B with a constant value of, let's say, 93. Okay. So 93 in this case is actually 93 in base 10. Okay. So the effect of this is to lecture, it is how it gets it done, how it gets the job done that we are focusing on in today's lecture. So what we'll do is we are taking a look at the assemble tab because this tab shows us you know, what opcode it translates to. It translates to 6D in hexadecimal and then 5D is actually 93 in hexadecimal because 5 times 16 is 80 and then plus the 13, which is the D, that will give us 93. So that's base conversion, you know, from base 16, you know, between base 16 and base 10. Are we doing okay so far with all this stuff? Okay. okay. <clears throat> so LDIB with something, if you go back to the opto table, it will tell you that you know, the 6 is going to be a constant because 0, 1, and 0 has to be there. And then the one one has to be here as well. But if I specify register B, then X has to be. Okay, let's see. You should probably know this by now, but I'm just gonna let you guys look it up. If I need register B, what are the two bits? Zero one. That is correct. So that means uh, zero one and zero a six. One one zero one is our D, which is which is thirteen. So that's why you know, the assembler is giving us 6D as the actual opcode over here. And then the 5D, as I said a little bit earlier, the 5D is the 93. Okay, you know, 93 in decimal is 5D in hexadecimal. All right, so that's the whole assembly process. And what we'll do next is to put, you know, put, put these values into RAM and then see how the program executes. Now we switch back to, oh, okay, I just passed the class bit. There we go. So now we get here, and then we go to the RAM component, and then we put in 6D as the opcode, and then 5D as the constant, the value that we want to put into register B. <clears throat> and now we start to execute the instruction. 
So there was one time in this particular class where I referred to each location a slice because it is really reflecting a slice of time <coughs> from the perspective of the instructor. So when you when you see the term slice in the lab, it means that the location is around. Okay, all right. So I'm kind of surprised that nobody has to write it down. You know, looks like you guys can all kind of just remember that. Just you know, observation. Um, <coughs> so a slice is a location in a plot. Okay, this is the case of a slice of a circle. This is the concept of the term slice. All the locations are the same. Then everything is on the scale of a slice. Okay, in fact, there's no need to do base conversion if the answer needs to be in hexadecimal. <coughs> So we'll quickly go through uh, the fetch operation. The fetch operation happens when the microcode pointer is 000, zero, zero and we have a writing error. So control T, this is after fetch. So after the fetch, the opcode is going to be in the instruction register. So if I scroll, scroll, up, scroll up a little bit, you can see how the instruction register now has 6D, which is the opcode that we want to execute in this case. <coughs> The next control T is going to be a falling edge, and the only thing it's going to do, the process it's going to do, is to increment the microcode pointer. So here's control T. It is now incremented to 001. So there's no particular name for this particular step other than, oh, we're just incrementing the microcode pointer. The next uh, rising edge is going to increment the stack, I mean, the, uh, the program counter. So the program counter is uh, right here. So that this is the program counter. So the next rising edge is going to increment the program counter. So once again, it doesn't really have a very specific name. So there we go. <clears throat> and then the next falling edge is important, okay? Because the, when the microcode pointer is at location zero, zero, 001, and we are having a falling edge, this is called the decode phase of executing an instruction. So this one is important, okay? You might need to take notes. Well, good. If you cannot, you might want to kind of write it down because it is this is the exact moment that is called a decoding. <coughs> Control T. Now we have just decoded. So after decode, we have the rising edge. Yeah. So this particular program is called the execution phase of an instruction cycle. In other words. All the previous steps is really to just to get to this point. So this is called the execution phase of the instruction cycle or the ex instruction execution cycle. This is the last phase of everything. So at this point, we have to analyze the processor to find out you know, who is doing what. Okay. So we go through the same process of going through the register bank. At this time, the register bank has input. inside the register bank, E, register A to register D, one of them is going to get updated. <clears throat> if I really start to find out which one is updated, I can always look inside by right-clicking and then you know, clicking on View Reg Bank. And we can see the how register B is the only one with an enable, you know, turning you know, bright green, which is the one. Everybody else has enable being a zero, so that means the register B is about to update on the rising edge. So the reason why register B is the only one that is enabled has to do with in register input select is a zero one, and the decoder is a demultiplexer with a constant input of one, and it is enabled as a zero. So this part I think we have already talked about you know, in the previous class, so nothing too surprising here. Um, and then register in is this content, you know, to figure out why that is the case. So now we go back into the main circuit, and then we ask, why is input select, why is register input select um, a zero one? Well, I mean, you know, there's not a whole lot of, you know, thing you need to explain, because RI cell, which is register input select, is one of the tunnels, you know, coming out of the ROM output, or the, the data port of ROM. So if you track it down, you will find it right here. And that is coming out of UK 
microcode data or microcode data, which then is coming out of the ROM. So basically, our explanation stops right here. It's like, oh, okay, the ROM just told us that the register input select port should be label one, and the register input enable should be a one. So all of these, both uh, the RI box, RIEN, and RI cell, all of these are coming out of the ROM. So that means you know, there's no further explanation needed in order to explain these things. So what is the next natural question to ask? Now that we know register two is a value, what is the next question? <clears throat> okay, so who is providing a value to update register B? Okay, that's a very good question. So we need to track down. Okay, we need to track it down. So the best way to do it is to go back here Look at the D port of the register B and then see how it is connected. It is connected to register in as a port. And when you go out to the main circuit, this is you know, the register in you know, wire. So now we have to say, okay, who is determining the value of this port? It's coming out of a multiplexer. The multiplexer is enabled because RIEN is also used to enable the multiplexer. So now we have to say, okay, but which input are we connecting to the output? RI mux is a dark wing. It connects to the select port. So that means you know, in this case, input zero connects to the output of this multiplexer. So now we have to track down who is connected to this node here. This is not an output, so we are not concerned about it. This is an output, but you know this particular D multiplexer is disabled, it's turned off, so we are not concerned about this one. This is also not an output. We are not concerned about it. So now, finally, we get all the way out here, and then we find that oh, yeah. selection. Yep, I lost the selection. Let me click again. <clears throat> so finally, when we move over here, we can see that it's the data port of RAM that eventually connects to the input to this port B of register B. So, okay, fine. So what is the value? First of all, is RAM even enabled? Well, we, we certainly hope so. Yep, RAM is enabled because select is a bright green, it is a one. The next natural question to ask is, you know, are we reading or um, are we reading or are we writing? Because LD is bright green, we are reading from RAM, which means you know, the D port of RAM is acting as an output, which is perfect, right? Because you know, we definitely need the D port of RAM to be an output. <clears throat> now that we know the RAM component is enabled and we're in read mode, what are the two natural questions to ask? We know we are reading from RAM. We know the RAM component is enabled. So what do we ask next? Where we are reading from, okay? Because we already know the, the, the content is going to register B, so the question is, where who is determining where we are reading, where we are reading from? So which port determines that? Which port of RAM determines which location we are reading or writing? A. Port A. Very good. So you know, only one person is responding to my questions. I am hoping th for those of you who are not responding. You know the answer, you just chose not to skip speak out in the class. Because at this time, it is important that you know the answer to all of those questions already. If you cannot answer those questions, that means you have some reviewing and studying to do <coughs> before it's too late. All right, so here's the A port. We try to track down who is specified the content on the A port of RAM. It goes all the way back. You know, this is not an important connection because we cannot really specify a value. This, on the other hand, can. So it is the output of a multiplexer. The multiplexer has an enable of one. Excuse me, I take it back. Has a select of one, which means we are connecting input one to the output of this multiplexer. These two are now connected. So now I have to track down you know, who is driving, who is specifying the value on the uh, on input one of this 
this multiplexer, and then this, go, this all goes all the way back to the program counter itself. So now we have we know the connections, okay? We know the two connections that we need to know. And if I were taking notes this entire time, okay, which I have not been, but if I were taking notes this entire time, I'm you know, bringing up my mouse pad here, just so that I can you know, basically say, if I were taking notes, you know, what would I have written down so far? So what I would have written down so far is uh, register B, register B, D port connects to the D port of RAM. Uh, no RAM is selected, okay? This is significant because you know, it means you know, the RAM component is enabled. RAM.LD is also a one. This is also important because this makes the D port of RAM an output port. And then finally, we also know that RAM.A, the address port of RAM, is connected to <coughs> the program counter Q port, which is the output of the program counter. So right now, okay, at this point, I can already summarize the entire thing as B is getting the D reference of the program. from RAM, the location we are reading from is pointed to by the program counter. So that's why I use the D reference operator borrowed from DISP prefix. <coughs> but the analysis, the analysis does not end here because we are not really quite done with analyzing everything that can be updated, such as the program counter itself. So the program counter is going to be updated as well. So now we have to track down who is specifying the value to update the program counter with. So the program counter D port is coming from the output of this multiplexer. This multiplexer has a select of zero. Okay, so we can basically say, oh, okay. Yes, we can just say that, but we don't know why PC Mux is a zero because PC Mux does not come from RAM. In other words, what you know, if you try to examine all the tunnels coming out of microcode data and all the tunnels coming out of the actual D port of ROM, none of them says PC Mux. So PC Mux is not coming straight out of a ROM at all. Instead, it is coming out of here. So that means, you know, if I were to read, if I really want to connect everything all the way back to the output of the ROM. And I really have one more step to do because now I have to try to explain why is PC Mux a zero. So the output of this multiplexer is a zero, and you can see that there are seven, seven out of eight inputs of this multiplexer are zeros. Which one are we selecting in this case? Um, that is being selected by PC Mux Mux because this multiplexer determines the output of another multiplexer. So PC Mux Bus is five or one zero one in uh, in binary. So now we just count. This is zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is five. <clears throat> so now we know why PC Mux is a zero because PC Mux Mux is a five, and input five of this multiplexer is a zero. So now the question is, what of PC Mux Mux is that coming straight out of the ROM? The answer is yes. That one does come straight out of the ROM, which means my explanation can stop here. So now we go back to the program counter and we go like, okay, so we already know that we are connecting the input zero to the output of this multiplexer. So what is input zero itself connected to? It is connected to an auto increment mechanism where essentially adding one to the program counter and then store the resulting value back into the program counter. Now that means that in my notes, okay, so if I were taking notes, then I would also say, oh, by the way, you know, we also need to add one to the program counter. So PC is going to be B plus one. So when you combine these two expressions, you can just say that B, 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 register B, is updated by the program counter post increment. So they did exactly the same thing in this case. <coughs> do we have any questions about the concept of after <coughs> mentioning of the variable. 
that concept okay, and everybody is familiar with that concept and be able to distinguish that concept from putting the plus plus before a variable, which is pre-implementing, instead of post-implementing. All right, very good. So that explains, okay? In other words, we know what the program is supposed to do. We just need to know how it is getting it done. So now the question is, what are we exactly putting into register B? Well, that part is actually pretty easy because the RAM component does highlight the location that has That means if I were to do a control T, I should be able to observe that register B becomes 5D. So that means that when we look at the output pin corresponding to the current value of register B, it should become 0101, which is the 5, 1101, which is the D. So here's control T, control T. But I also want to keep an eye on the program counter because the program counter is also supposed to increment again so that it will become 02. So this should become 0, 02, this should become 0, 01, 0, 01, 1, 1, 0, 01. So here's control T, bing, exactly as we thought it should be. So these are what we would implement in register B. This is the entire thing that we need to do in LBI instruction. If I do not also implement the program counter, then the program counter will stay at 0, 01. So the next thing that we need to do is the fetch of the next so we would have fetched the we would have fetched the byte as location zero one as if it is an object when it is not an object. Because the byte at location zero one, it is not an opcode. It is the constant that the opcode needs in order to put a value in the register. So now Do we have any questions up to this point? Are there any questions about the process of how to figure out how the processor gets a particular instruction generated? Because the process is far more important than the end, actual end result. The end result of what the processor or what this instruction is going to do is already summarized in the optical table. So that part is already here. There's no need for us to actually memorize anything. But to figure out how the processor gets the job done requires you to go through this whole instruction diagram and say, okay, who is actually going to do you know, this particular operation? That is an important part for this class. I think it is a really important part of this class because you know, this is showing you how instructions execute inside the process. Are we doing okay so far? Right? <clears throat> so with the LBI instruction done, let's just go ahead and reset the simulator. Okay, so here we go. The RAM is clear. So this time I'm going to you know, check out another instruction. So what you probably need to do, okay, to study for this class is to kind of go through this process on your own. Okay, and not just be watching the video, not by watching the video and replicating what you see in the video. But you're basically going like, okay, I want to track down, you know, how the ST instruction gets the, gets the job done. So I'm going to give myself a test instruction, put some you know, values into registers, you know, whichever two you choose. Um, and then I want to be able to explain how it gets the job done. Okay? That is essential. That is basically how, you know, I would study for this class at this point, you know, in this semester. All right. So the ST instruction, in terms of what it does, is really simple, okay? It is just simple, because the thing that it reads is pressed by 5. It is using as a pointer the location that it wants to read RAM, which updated to the value of whatever register you specify in the instruction. That's what it does here. So when I said simple, I'm making the assumption that you already know what a pointer is. 
you know what the referencing is, you know what the pointer is from CISD 360. So if you think that you might need some refreshing on those concepts, you might want to, you know, kind of you know, do that, you know, before you get too far off with this kind of description. And the next question is, how do I get a refresher on, you know, the pointer concept and how the reference works in C and C++? There are many ways to do it. You can go to Google, okay, you can go to Google, and then you just, you know, look up, oh, this. Uh, yesterday I was talking about how Google is actually planning to become an energy provider by running their own nuclear plant. I'm not kidding you. You would think that this is fiction, but it's not. Anyway, so you want to look up C++, pointer, C, reference, uh, maybe even throw in tutorials, okay? There are plenty, okay? There are plenty of material on the internet that can teach you or remind you what is the referencing in C++, what is the pointer in C++, and so on. If you feel that you might need a refresher on something like that, you know, Google is free, okay, you can just use it, or you can use your chat GPT, okay, your chat GPT is kind of more conversational, so if you are you know, not fully understanding a particular concept in the conversation, you can ask chat GPT, you know, can you explain what this concept is? Okay, so that's another way to do it. All right, so we are gonna, I'm gonna give myself an experiment, okay? So I need to specify a few things. So let's just say that I want to use register C as a uh, pointer, and wherever it points to in RAM, it's gonna be updated to the value of, say, register B, okay? I'm just randomly picking two registers from the four, and I want to also make you know, register C a particular value to begin with. So I want to make register C to start with a value of, let's say, FD, okay, in hexadecimal. And I want register B to have a value of anything other than 0, 0 is good, because you know, this way I can actually see the result happening. So, okay, you guys can help me pick. In yesterday's class, you know, somebody picked the 4, 2 because of the... Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yep, 87, okay, so 87, okay, do you mean 87 or 87? 87, so 87 is 5 times 16 plus 7, which is 5, 7 in hexadecimal, so is that your, okay, all right, cool, so both of these are hex in hexadecimal, and we'll go ahead and set up the whole thing, so the first thing we need to do is to figure out, okay, this is the RTL description of what we want to do. Tell me again, what is RTL? Yep, that is correct, very good, okay. So I'm just checking, you know, because you know, I have mentioned RTL quite a few times already, and I'm just making sure that you guys have been taking notes or you know, otherwise you know, remembering that RTL stands for Register Transfer Language. The reason why that is important is because in the next exam, I might mention something like, well, the following is the RTL of blah, blah, okay? And I don't want anyone to come up to me and ask, so what is RTL? Okay, you know, because RTL has been explained multiple times in this class already. <clears throat> All right, so this is the RTL. Okay, so I'm just gonna say this is the RTL. So now we need to figure out what is the opcode, okay? So, well, before that, okay, I can also give you the mnemonic. We are storing whatever register, register B has to wherever register C is pointing to. So the mnemonic intentionally added to the top here in parentheses to sort of indicate that C is the reference, okay? So that single pair of parentheses does not need to be there. I specify the syntax to include it so that we can we can easily tell which part is the reference. So this is our demand, M and C mod X itself. So now we need to figure out the opcode. Okay, so here's the opcode. So to figure out the opcode, you have to go to the opcode table and then go to FT. So now we have to identify which one is register A. Register A is register B. Register B requires zero one to specify. Rest 
So that means you know, my actual opcode in hexadecimal is F6. Now we just basically summarize the F6 in hexadecimal is the opcode. 0x is a prefix to indicate the number after that is a hexadecimal number. It is basically the same thing as you putting 16 in parentheses after the number itself. Okay, it's just an emphasis that we have a base 16 number. Just a notation. This notation is also in C and C++, so that means anytime you want to specify an integer value, you know, the base 16 number, you can also say 0x and you have a binary number. Okay, those two things are supposed to be the same. All right, cool. So now we switch back to um, larger sim. Okay. And everything is now reset. Okay, so I got a few things to do before we can even run the instruction. So the first thing is I have to go to the register bank and then change regi register D to what we agreed to, which I think is 57, and then register C is FC. If that's how we wanted to set up these two, let me just double check. Yep, okay, so that's how we wanted to set it up. And then the opcode, which is F6, has to go to the first location of RAM. Because you know, the program executes from the uh, execute the code from RAM starting with location zero zero. So now we change this location to F6, and now we can test run the code again. So this is the kind of thing that I want. I think will be helpful if you want to ask me how do I study for this class at this point of the semester. This is how we do it. Okay, we go through the whole exercise of figuring out what we want to test, specify in RTL. You specify in mnemonic. Once you specify in mnemonic, you can use the assembler to help you double check to make sure that you got it right. In other words, you can use the assembler, go to the source tab, and just say, oh, I want to specify STCB. What is the exact option? Go to the assemble view, and it gives you exactly F6 also. So this is how you double check whether your understanding All of that is important. Okay, your next exam will involve all of these things that I just told you. <clears throat> all right. So now that we have you know, the simulator all set up, I'm going to do the same thing as last time. I'm going to read through everything all the way until I have got the read through command. Okay. So we need to fetch. Fetch, increment microcontroller pointer, increment the program counter, decode, now we are ready to run. Okay? In other words, one quick and easy thing we have to do to run execute phase of an instruction cycle is simply to compare the content of the instruction register with the content of the microcode pointer. If the instruction register, if the two digits of the instruction register are the same of the, as the two digits of the micro code pointer, and then the rightmost digit is a zero. That means you are in the execution phase of the instruction cycle. So that's a very visual way to tell, you know, am I executing instruction? Okay. Hmm? Yes. So F60 because F60 being the uh, being the value of the register is directly connected to the A port of ROM. So that's why we are also addressing that location. All right. So that location has 26 bits, just like you know all the other locations of ROM, and all those bits goes everywhere. So now we go through the same analysis, but this time the register bank does not have input enabled, which means none of the register is being updated. But it doesn't mean the register bank is not being used. It simply means none of the registers is getting updated. But I'm not going to ask any questions you know, regarding the register bank and things like that. How will I know if whether a register is being used? So I will skip to the next component, which is the RAM component. So now I look at the RAM component. The from register is being utilized, which means RAM is being used to stay enabled. And LD is a document which is being you know, modified. In other words, the intent 
tensor is to change a location of ramp to a particular value. Okay, so let's let's let us listen to that one statement again. Okay, the intention is to change the location. Okay, that's point number one to a certain value. That's number two. That is asking two questions right there already, because I'm implicitly asking which, who is telling me to which location I should change, and then who is telling me how to change or what value to go into that location. So there are two implicit questions with what I just said. Okay, so we'll try to figure that out. Um, it's up to you. Okay, you know some people would like to go in by alphabetical order. If you're one of those people, then we'll try to figure out how A port is connected. In other words, who's telling me which location I should change? Not what it should be, but where. Okay, so let's track down the A port. Okay, so it goes all the way back to this multiplexer that we saw earlier as well. But this time, ADDR mux is dark green. It is selecting input zero to connect to the up. Yeah, input zero to connect to the output. So now we have to track down input zero. Input zero is coming out of a B multiplexer that is always enabled, and this is output zero. So we have to make sure that the select is also dark green because you know, that's the only way to connect the input to output zero for this B multiplexer, and it is consistent, so we are good. So now we track down this wire and say, okay, who is connected to this wire? It's coming out of output one of the register bank. Now it's time to go into the register bank. This is output one. And now we track down this wire, which is coming out of a multiplexer. The select of this multiplexer is one zero, which means this input or input two of this multiplexer connects to the output, and that eventually connects to the output of register two. So, all said, now we know that If I were taking notes, okay, um, I would probably write something down. Okay, I would probably write down something like this for at least for this point. At this point, I can say register C dot C. The output of register C is connected to uh, the A port of RAM. So the reason why it is directional like this is. Because doing. Now, you might say, but that is probably quite drastic to change the data. The whole bunch of multiplexers and people are going to be connected to make that change. That is true, okay? But eventually, it has to be the correct answer to this question. That is actually what we do. Okay? But this can also summarize into something like this. We are really just getting to whatever register C is pointing to. From it, are you writing to it? You know, we don't know yet. Okay, yeah, so the next step is going to determine what we are going to do with the data in the register. Okay, the upstream is the random state, and the input that has an output that function actually has a state. That's what the point does. that pointer is introduced in the front of that something, the pointer, to be connected to the other point of RAM, which then is used to select, hey, which location do you want to be located? It can be reading, can be writing, but the job of the address port is simply to specify which location of RAM. All right, so does this help in terms of, you know, for those people who have always been wondering what the point of is and how it is used. Or does it actually make it more confusing? Okay. Because I asked the same question in the Tuesday, Thursday class, and some people said that this really helps to clarify what the point of view is and what dereferencing is about. Okay. Because dereferencing simply means you're connecting that value to the address point. That's dereferencing. All right. So we've got you know, another question that we have to answer, which is the B port. 
So let's go back out and ask who is connected to the D port. Because when we have a memory write operation, the D port is acting as an input. Track down this node, okay, it goes to this output port. The output port doesn't really cannot be used to specify a value, so we can ignore this one. Um, the, well, the node also con connects to the D part of the instruction register. Once again, that is an input, it cannot be used to specify a value, so that's useless. Um, it is also connected to the input zero of this multiplexer and input one of this multiplexer. So once again, those are also input ports. They cannot be used to specify a value. So the only thing that can specify a value is right here. The output uh, output two of this D multiplexer is connected to the D port of RAM. So once we see that this is output two of the D multiplexer, we kind of have to make sure that the select is also you know, a two. So we click on it, and it really is a two, which is good. So that means you know this input connects to the output we're expecting. The D multiplexer also has to be enabled. Yep, it is enabled. So R O zero E N, which stands for register output zero enabled, comes into the box. That means I don't really have I don't need to give another explanation of why D multiplexer is enabled. R O zero E N register output zero E N. Also, because it is coming up from, so that means I don't need to explain that. All right. So the next question is, uh, who is connected to the input of this D multiplexer? It's output zero of the register bank. So now we go into the register bank, and then we track down, you know, what this, where this wire is connected from. It is connected. It's the output of this multiplexer. This multiplexer has a select of zero one. So that means input one connects to the output, and input one connects to the output of register E. So this is when we figure out that, oh, okay, so the value of register E is connected to the D port of RAM. So if I were taking notes, I would have some said something like this. RAM.D is register register E dot U. Um, so that means you know, together we now know that we are writing to RAM using the value of register E. So is that okay so far? Okay, cool. So now we go back to Logisim, you know, just to kind of visualize the actual effect of running this. Okay, so our observation should be at uh, with register, or not with the register. None of the registers is getting updated. RAM is getting updated. So this is location FD. You can see this is location FC, which is the first column of the uh, array. This is the second item, so it is at location FD. We are expecting this location to change to 57 in hexadecimal because that is 87 in decimal. So here comes control T. Go. So today, you know, just in less than an hour's time, uh, I have gone through the process of analyzing two uh, instructions, and you know, this is basically how you study for this class. Okay, you just pick you know some instructions that we preferably something that we have already talked about, so you can do two experiments with this, or something that is closely related, like the LD instruction. LD instruction is closely related to the other two that we have talked about. Let's check out why they are related. So if I were to just look at the RTL of the three instructions that are kind of all mentioned in today's lab, we have LDI to begin with. So if I have LDI, X, and then some kind of immediate value, the RTL to describe this is register X get you know, the referencing PC++. In other words, we are reading from RAM, okay, because anytime you have the D referencing in the box, that means you know, you can kind of you know, read from RAM. In this case, it's the same code, so we can kind of read from RAM. And it comes up with an array of PCs. In this case, the program counter connects to the address port, and
and specifies which location we are leaving. We also talk about the ST instruction. Okay, so the ST instruction looks like this, and the RTL, the register transfer language, describe this as whatever Y is pointing to, change it to X. So that is the opposite direction. So LD is kind of like mm, a weird offspring between these two. So LD is, it looks like this, okay, the X and the Y are you know, kind of exchanged in terms of position. And the way it, it, what it does is this. That's what it does. So that's why I said it's kind of like this weird pie. This here is being programmed just like LDR, except specifies the location of the entity is not the program counter. It is another register of the property, register two, a register property. Um, it is kind of like the ST in a sense, because we are also using a register to specify its location. But instead of writing to memory, like ST, we are using a memory. So that's why you know I said the LD instruction is kind of like a weird child where it takes up half the trait from LDI and the other half of the trait picked up from ST. So if you're taking notes and you're drawing like you know two, you know, figurines in one has a label of LDI and then has this label of ST and they're holding in hands and having a child you know labeled as LD, that would be a good way to take notes too. Yeah. Whatever make whatever Right? <clears throat> so at this point, we have gone through a few instructions already in terms of tracing everything in class. So before this, we had the add instruction, which is basically is just you know, taking the, um, it, it's basically calculating the sum between x and y and then storing that to x. So th these three are the instructions that we have tracked down already in class. Certainly hope you know, no, shouldn't be pretty experiment. If not, change add and subtract. Okay? Because you know, between add and subtract, the only difference is are we doing x plus y over here or x minus y over here. Okay? But that minor difference you know, does show up in the ALU because OTSTL or the operation select is going to be slightly different when we are performing the okay. um, All right, so do we have any questions about these two instructions that we just talked about today? Let me highlight the two that we just talked about. So once again, the process of how we, how we figure out how the processor gets the job done is our current focus. It is not so much what it is doing, it is how it gets the job done, and how it gets the job done is basically the you know, basically the operation and the interconnection of the multiplexers, the multiplexers, registers, RAM, you know, and all those things. Let's look at the RTL, okay? Because the RTL would answer that question too. So this is LDI, and what is on the left-hand side of the equal sign? The register. So the register itself is updated. But what we use to update the register is pulled from RAM, but the location is right after the operation stuff. Most of those questions you can also answer by running these experiments on your own. Okay, now I, I'm not saying that you should not ask questions in class, but I'm also telling you that if you have any further questions about this material, running the experiments through Artisim 
is the best way to get those an questions answered. Because every time you have a question, and you try to run the experiment and try to explain you know, what is happening in logic team, you are just revealing everything. You're revealing what are the, what the active components are in the processor and how all the active components interact. When I said active components, I'm referring to the registers, RAM, and the Yes, you have Their job is to connect everything up. So the actual important components of the processor are really just the registers and RAM. So registers and RAM are captured by the RTL description already. And that's why the RTL description is so important because it really summarizes what the construction does. Of course, you know, somebody is going to say, but that, this is just you, okay? Only you can make use of RTI to describe an instruction. Well, that is actually not the case. If you try to read the instruction set of an ARM processor, it is also described in RTL. The ARM processor is probably one of the most used processor by today's standard. What is the ARM processor, by the way? What does ARM stand for? A R M. So let's go check it out. Okay, this is actually within the scope of this class. We are supposed to talk about RISC versus CISC. So what does RISC and ARM have to do with each other? Okay, so I'm already at the right place to ask the question. So I'm just going to type them in, like ARM, ARM, and RISC. Okay, and I can tell you, Google will find the answer right away because these two terms are closely related. Right, so we'll click on this link here. Okay. Yeah. So this link brings us to the ARM website. So ARM stands for Advanced Risk Management. Okay. That's just the that's just the name of the product. So what is this product? Okay, so the architecture, the processor architecture is called ARM ARM, but the company is also called ARM. Okay, so I think you know, that can cause a little bit of confusion sometimes. ARM is not a chip maker. They don't make chips. So they're not like uh, Qualcomm. Qualcomm is not a chip maker itself. ARM is not like that. Okay, so they have a chip manufacturing plant. It is an IT company. It is an intellectual property company. So ARM basically just designs the processor like the way I designed the TPT in this class. It is on paper. It can be simulated, you can run it in simulation, and all that stuff. But they don't make the chip. Instead, they license the design. So you might ask, so who are the companies? Who are the clients of ARM? You know, how do they license? What do they license the processor design to? Qualcomm. Okay, so what does Qualcomm make? What is their most common product? Chips. Okay, but what, what kind of chips? Tortilla chips, potato chips, corn chips. Yep. CPU. Okay, but what kind of CPU? Be more specific. Cell phone processors. Okay, so Qualcomm is one of the main suppliers of you know, cell phone processors. So ARM is going to make a deal with you know, Qualcomm and say, okay, for every chip that you make, we're going to get some ours, the IP, the intellectual property is ours. So we are letting you to make this process. So what Qualcomm does to do in return is to say, okay, so we, we now have the right, okay, to, to put this processor core onto a die. A die is basically a piece of silicon, you know, that has a processor and so forth. So before, you know, uh, high integration, you have a processor chip, you have some RAM, you have some flash chip and all the other chips. So your cell phone is not going to be like this small. It's going to be much bigger because you have multiple chips and then you need a bigger circuit board, blah, blah, blah. So Qualcomm says, oh, with the current process, which is 5 nanometer, I can put the entire chip and RAM and a bunch of other stuff. Okay? Possibly I 
not sure if you can possibly using, you know, Wi-Fi and do other things that you want your cell phone to have all at the same time. So now you have a very high integration, which means one single chip in the pot in your cell phone is doing multiple things, you know, because you also have memory, which is you know, typically is a separate thing. So that's how ARM makes money. Okay, it licenses its core design to other people where they would incorporate the core uh, and along with many other new components into the Mac. How many people here has a uh, newer Mac book that makes use of the M1 or the M2 chip? Okay, so we've got one person here with a, is it an M1 or the M2? M1? Okay. So what is the M1 chip from Apple? Okay, if you don't know, you know, this is the, See, Google is really helpful, okay? You just look up Apple, M1. That's all you need to do. So M1 is the ARM-based system on a chip. The system on a chip of M code C is actually a term. So basically what you have to do is you have to you know, approach a, you know, ARM or something like this and say, hey, you know, we, we want to incorporate an ARM. I don't know, okay, but they're going to take the money to keep these chips that Apple is making that is using the ARM, including the ARM that is okay. So I have a friend, I have a buddy, you know, who uses a newer you know, Apple you know, MacBook, and he is thoroughly impressed by this Apple MacBook because he was comparing this MacBook to his PC laptop computer and noticed how fast the Apple computer was. It is fast. There's not a whole lot of heat dissipation because you know, okay, you can see that the heat is really good. <laughs> so how does it get in there? There's no fan. It's just by, con yeah, go ahead. that are very specialized, your conductor for heat, it's very efficient, um, but nonetheless, it is just conducting to the casing itself, and that's how it gets rid of all the heat. Now, you compare that to my laptop computer here. My laptop computer has two big exhaust like this, okay? So when I you know, actually do some work, that, that, you know, that's significant. This thing sounds like an F-35 taking off, like the jet airplane, okay? And it has you know, matching sizes for the exhaust too. Because this thing is not efficient. Okay? It has the processor as one chip. The RAM are separate chips. Okay? The Wi-Fi component, separate chips. The USB controller, separate chip, and so on. So that's why it's bigger, it's less efficient, and slower at the same time, all at the same time. The M1 and the M2 chips are impressive because they, are, they manage not only the processor and the RAM, but also all the essential components on this one single physical die. With one single physical die, that means the circuit board gets a lot less complicated because otherwise you'll be using the circuit board to route the signal to each and every one. But these are all on chip. Okay? And it's smaller, it's lighter, it's more efficient, and the performance is higher too because now the physical actual distance between the components is like in my case, the processor chip is here, the RAM is over here, the, the um, chipset you know, is over here, so they have significant differences or significant distances between the components. And that's also what is slowing down the components and also what is driving the energy up because you need a higher voltage to get the signal across in a short amount of time. Not too much, okay, you know, the connectors you know, really do not have a lot of resistance, but it does make the board bigger, and it's a lot less expensive. So most people think about you know, expensive on a computer, it's like, oh, the chips are the least expensive, I take it back. Most people think connectors are cheap, and the chips are the ones that are more expensive, 
then it's not entirely true. And connectors can be very expensive by comparison. So by putting the system on the tip and everything is soldered, they actually lower the manufacturing cost. Yeah. The motherboard cannot be replaced or repaired and reported by users, not by end users, right? You cannot upgrade this mother brand anymore. Whereas I can, if I can open up the back, they're all screwed in. Okay? So I can open up the back, it's going to be a sodium, a single, small outline, dual inline memory module. Okay, so so I can actually replace mine. If I want to expand my computer to 32 gigs of RAM, I can do that. But how often do you want to upgrade the RAM? Not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So your computer is more or less permanent to have the hard disk to accommodate the firmware you have, right? So the other reason why you know uh, your computer consumes so much less energy compared to mine has to do with yours is a risk resistance state. The use instruction set computer risk is a design philosophy, but they say, okay, we instead of specifying the process and the instructions within the system set, we are going to use a system at the expense Try to reduce the least number of practitioners to get a job. Complexity will then be lost in the instruction set. Okay, the point instruction is going to get lost. But that part is easy because we have something called compilers. So we are still trying to run a program that also contains C++. Okay, the C++ program does not make a difference whether you have a Sys architecture. programmers, there's no cost in using this instead of SIS. Okay? But the saving is significant. Because this computer, um, the chip is probably was probably manufactured last year. But back when it was built, they made it in like ten years. So uh, not required in my case because I'm running Linux. I'm running Linux any day. Right? I have no need to try to use a bigger computer to have backward compatibility all the way back to the 80s. So why do you think CISC computers have backward compatibility all the way back to DOS? It is a long line of extension, you know, from the 16-bit computer from the 80s. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you something that is probably not a whole lot of, it's not meaningful unless I explain what it is. So I'm going to go to Debian. Okay, so go to Debian. Probably will give me Camel Rose, okay. So Debian, is a distribution of Linux. I'm not going to get into what the distribution is. I'm just going to call this Camel Rose. Okay? So I can run Debian as an operating system on the AMD64 and the Intel64 instruction set. So this is the most common instruction set for you know, modern day PCs, except for MacBooks. Um, x86 based, you know, i386, these are much older um, PCs. The ARM architecture. So there are a few ARM architectures here, so depending on which one. So the Raspberry Pi, for instance, uses the ARM architecture. Your cell phones uses the ARM architecture. So most of you are now thinking, so that means I can run Linux on my Android. Exactly, it is already running Linux. Okay. Linux is the foundational layer of Android. Android is basically a 
user uh, interface layer on top of Linux. So your phone, if you have an Android phone, it's running Linux already. Okay, it, it's not like it can run Linux. It is already running Linux. 64-bit um, ARM, you know, those are the newer architecture. So your MacBook probably has a 64-bit ARM as opposed to a 32-bit. Uh, MIPS is interesting. MIPS is a uh, instructional computer architecture that was pioneered by UC Berkeley. So UC Berkeley was so there's a 64-bit version and then there's a 32-bit version. Uh, power system, otherwise known as is used mostly by IBM. And the funny thing is Apple was also using power system. So Apple was originally using the Motorola 68000 processor. Then they switched to the power PC uh, because they were working out a deal with IBM at the time. And the power PC architecture specifically designed for emulation, so that you can emulate any instruction set with the least amount of cost from the hardware perspective. That deal did not work out too well between IBM and Apple, and that's why we don't really hear about the PowerPC architecture much more these days. Another architecture that make, made use of the PowerPC was, when I say Sony, and which product from Sony makes use of the PowerPC architecture? PlayStation, yep, exactly. And which PlayStation? I cannot remember which one, but the, it was so good, okay? Because because Sony was putting in, I think, sixteen of the power PC made game console, and it was so well thought out and so well manufactured that the military of the United States decided to make a data center of PlayStation. <laughs> it was three. Okay, so the PlayStation Three was became you know, one of the main components of the of the data center of the U, of the U.S. military until Sony says, "Oh, we are not. We are going to stop supporting your third party operating system." So once they did that, you know, then the whole thing is off. You can cannot do that anymore. Um, IBM System Three Ninety. That's a mainframe architecture. Early, the mid to late seventies. It's the same. It's the same operating system. This is just a partial list of the of the most common operating system. So a single operating system called Linux. So let me ask you, what kind of architecture the current version of Windows supports? The AMD 64 architecture, yep. It has ARM support, but that's two, just two. Yep. Sorry, I meant RISC-V. RISC-V. Hmm? RISC-V. RISC-V. Is that ARM-based? No. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay. Windows 64. Windows 64. Yeah, Windows 64. Yeah, Windows 64. Windows 64. Based processor. I think it's just x just x eighty six x sixty four, which is in the uh, Intel architecture versus ARM. So RISC five, did you say RISC five? So RISC five, I think maybe an ARM designed architecture. Oh, five. <laughs> Distance dream. Let's look at five and the D. So risk five looks like it is its own architecture. Yeah, looks like it is its own architecture. But at this point of time, any new architecture you know, that exists is just a mainframe compared to the ARM architectures. 
so many there are so many models that did that compile to the model that don't exist anymore. They are supporting R64. So a new architecture has to be much better in order to gain any kind of traction. So I'm I'm not putting a whole lot of hope into this side. It's and it also looks like it's this maybe you know heavily pushed by Microsoft because none of the other companies really care about the operating system in Linux. It's just you know they're putting it post sixty and they have you know the cloud in it. Okay. All right. So power consumption is, is a big thing. Risk has lower power consumption for the same amount of work to be done. Why do you think that is that makes a difference? Why is that important? Go ahead. Data center is only constrained by heat extraction. Heat extraction is, is a big thing. Now you don't even have to think about the data center. Okay, I know most of you do not do land parking and things like this. This may be a thing you want to do, right? So let's just say that you have a heat extraction One of you is going to have to do that. I'm, I'm bringing in my souped up, you know, gaming computer here. I'm going to share the same space with my home computer. Is that okay? So now we'll do some, we'll do some calculations. What is the power consumption of a typical desktop gaming computer? Throw a number. So we'll, we'll call it one kilowatt, okay? You know, just for rounding purposes, we'll say one kilowatt. So one kilowatt for each computer, okay? And this is a five five player game, okay? So let's just say that set up your living room, okay? You know, set up five tables and put in a hard drive. So multiply that by five, so you got five kilowatts. So five kilowatts to most people is just a number until you try to do this. First problem you encounter is this. Okay, popping your breaker. Let's just forget the keep popping your breaker. You need to keep the breaker. You can only do 110 volts at what 20, 30 amps, right? So that's like three kilowatts. Your entire living room is probably off of one single breaker. So that's that's the first problem. So they go like, okay, that's fine. I'm gonna hire a, an electrician, add a new circuit, and a new breaker to my living room. So my living room now has you know, up to, let's just say, you know, 10 kilowatts ability. So now power is not a problem. Five kilowatts. All five of you are playing video games. You're exercising your DVD to the max. Okay. Then you start to notice after maybe 20 minutes or so, it gets warm in here. Why do you think it's going to get warm? It does not matter whether it's water cooled or air cooled or you know, magically cooled, because cooling simply means moving the heat from one place to another place. Most, if not all, of the five kilowatts are eventually converted into heat. So how much heat is five kilowatts? A hair dryer is typically what? Isn't it a shape here? So this is almost like running four hair dryers. You go like, oh, big deal. I run my hair dryer you know, in my bathroom, okay, and it doesn't heat up a whole lot too much in the bathroom. Yes, how long do you have to run your hair dryer? I don't have a whole lot of hair anymore, so I don't even run the hair dryer. But even for those of you who run the hair dryer, what, 15 minutes, right? You know, it's not a big deal. A single day's is going to be at about what 20 25 minutes. 
something in the basement is running air dryers in one living room for 25 minutes and that's one day most houses cannot get rid of heat fast enough given that kind of heat load so this is not even that the center okay you have a fairly good sp good size space in a living room with only five computers you're not running racks of computers where on each rack you have multiple computers built and each one is taking is using more power than the main one so now you can kind of imagine the problem of a data center okay because your heat extraction is the limitation of how much processing power you can have in a data center and that's before ai too okay your ai just you kind of added your additional burden to the whole thing okay and that's why you know google was one of the first companies to make their own chip performing the ai related calculation because using a cpu to do all that calculation is awfully inefficient so google basically you know, made their own chip that's before your know, people started to realize hey we don't have to design our own chip we can just use the gpus you know from nvidia to do the thing so that's why nvidia is now a Three trillion dollar dollar company. At the beginning of this semester, I think I mentioned it was a two trillion dollar company. Now it is valued at three trillion dollars. Microsoft is also at the three three trillion dollar mark. Uh, so is Google, but it took Microsoft a much longer amount of time to get to three trillion. Nvidia just goes like this, and then Nick has this, and then AI has this. Microsoft just go like, um, how to make three, you know, three trillion dollars. So I, you know, this is the end of today's lecture. You know, I just want to put things in perspective. Okay, what you learn in this class won't let you actually design your own architecture such as ARM and Line, but it gives you the fundamentals so that if you need to work for a company in order to make CPUs or processors or you know, make enhancements to processors. Um, you will at least have the fundamental knowledge to do that. Which is probably important for the next at least five to ten years. That industry is gonna be it's gonna be hot again. Before AI, you know, it wasn't doing so well, you know, things are already at a plateau. Now with all the AI stuff, you know, there's a huge demand to optimize the hardware so that people can do AI calculation without using a whole lot of energy. Right, so I'm going to stop the recorder and then give you guys the access code to today's lab.